Howdy, howdy, everybody. Mike Verkest, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and our good old friend in this old house, Dr. Peter Antevi, for another edition of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Gentlemen, what's going on? How you doing, Mikey? Peter? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I can't hear. Oh, oh, who gets to say it first? Oh, my God. What is this? <laughs> amateur hour? You can't bring me on anymore. Come on. <laughs> What's going Man, on? Here, you dress bro. him up. You get him a nice microphone, and he still has the mute button. Man, what a rook. <laughs> what a rook. Congratulations on getting the new microphone, though. No, no this, is, no, this is the old microphone. My son, on the other hand, 12-year-old, who apparently needs this microphone for gaming, well, yeah. So he's got a better microphone than his father. So there you go. Wow. Is it a bigger one? Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was weird. Well done. That was a weird question, Jarvis. I know. I know. It's too early in the the pod to get terribly weird. <laughs> well, hey. So when we uh, when we sent out the promo on this, yeah, there would be one more doctor. We're we're short a doctor. Well, when you're like the magic man, like he is. He got the curse of the what? Late call, right? He did. So we're talking about Dr. Mark Peel. He is a pediatric intensivist at Wake. Um, he is also the medical director for their pediatric transport service. And um, he and I and, and Peter have been talking. Uh, he came and spoke at the, uh, gosh, I was going to say fast last year, but it's been. It was 19, fast 19. 19. Oh, I got my fast shirt on too. The, uh, the pre-COVID fast. That's right. Um, and so we were going to have him on to talk about this because he and Peter um, have kind of been beaten up on me a little bit about this ketamine only thing. Oh. And I thought it was only fair to have both of them on to talk about it. But uh, due to a scheduling error, he's actually on call tonight. And we got this text message as we were like five minutes out that said, oh, I got to I got to run intubate a uh, kid. Um so apparently kid is now going, we just got another text message. <laughs> going Kid's to going the to the OR, OR ah. and he is not a surgeon, so he won't be going with them. So he'll be joining us shortly. Sweet. Um, so thankfully he will, uh, he'll be with us. There's one well, thing for sure. If he would have had to innovate that kid, he would have used ketamine only. Yeah, that's just too <laughs> bad. Too bad, too bad. This, this is going to be such a good conversation because the uh, like, so obviously we've been planning this for a whole 24 hours, but let me tell you, <laughs> 24 hours is generous. The, the text machine was uh, flying and uh, pretty much all busting uh, Jarvis right in the chops about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. I'm, I'm getting ganged up on here. <laughs> it's going to be a good discussion because I will tell you, there's been a lot of conversation. We got a lot of people watching. Clearly, this is a topic that people want to know about. Like, well, I'm glad. I'm glad. It's a, I think it's a great topic. Um, their ketamine is such a wonderful drug. There are a lot of things you can do with them. Um, but just remember, Peter, you know, just cause you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. <laughs> hey, so I do see, the data, um, maybe <laughs> Peter, did I get it right? Um, he is at wake, right? Yeah. I get right. those three places confused. Yeah. He's a wake man in Raleigh. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, as soon I see Jay-Z saying, Tell me more about this wake. And I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah, He's actually at UNC, isn't he? <laughs> I, <laughs> I <messed it> up. <laughs> Good. So I do see that uh, I just wanted Jay-Z to know that I wanted to preempt him and go ahead and get in there that Texas is the delegated practice state. So, okay, so if, you got need that, if you got that on your bingo card, yep. which I don't think Jay-Z distributed for this particular live, but Rude. Uh, I'm just saying. I mean, it was distributed once. Where's the fun in that? I know. Well, I kind of figured that we'll just uh, have so many of his bingo cards that he will be so inebriated that he'll need to be intubated. <laughs> and exactly. then the big question will be, how do we do it? Exactly. That's right. Well, like, <laughs> like we usually do, let's uh, let's just do a little check-in. Um, Dr. Jarvis, what's going on with you? What's the... What's COVID doing in your world? What's what's new, buddy? COVID was sucking. It was, uh, man, it was way up past our highest peak. Uh, but it looks like we might, just in terms of new cases, yeah. looks like we might be on the downslope. Um, our hospitals were just packed. And now they seem to be opening up a bit. So maybe we're on the downside. I hope so. Peter, how about you? What's the Florida situation? 
Yeah, we're actually seeing some, you know, our, our case numbers are, are a little lower. Um, I'm kind of stuck in COVID vaccine hell right now with uh, have my own site up and running, as I know you guys do as well. And um, come to find out that we have run out of 1ML syringes, <laughs> meaning that instead of giving, getting the six doses per Pfizer vial, when you use a 3cc syringe, you then shrink it down to five doses. So I'm basically lost about, losing about 80 to 90 doses per day. So help me with that math. Yeah. What what what's what's the difference? Yeah, and tell us. Uh, so while you're there, so I got this uh, news blurb addressing that where we had to get like an EUA or something for a syringe to get that extra dose in. Tell do the math on that. Yeah. So basically, they're very small doses, right? Zero point three mLs, and when you're using a three mL syringe to get zero point three mLs you're never accurate. And okay. essentially what's happening is we, we end up essentially wasting. Um, so we don't have that exact 0.3 yeah. mLs at the very end yeah. for that six dose. Okay. And so we end up only getting five out of it. So if I'm using, let's say 80 vials a day or more, then I'm losing one dose per vial. Yeah. So 80 additional people. And wow. I have old people lined up down the block with walkers and I feel so bad for them. And we, you cannot find a one ml syringe. Oh my gosh. Wow. See, I was thrown off because we're doing Moderna. It's 0.5. And I'm like, how do you, <laughs> how yeah, can yeah. you not throw it 0.5? Well, that makes sense. I've never given or even seen the Pfizer stuff. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, that sucks. It does. It does. But well, so are you, I know we are tremendously um, rate limited here. So we just can't, the big bottleneck for us is there ain't enough vaccine to go around. Yeah. Um, and it is so the variation here. Um, so in rural East Texas, I mean, my dad got vaccinated. Um, geez, almost actually, he just got his second dose. So plenty of places out in rural areas. I'm in suburban Austin and my mom just got vaccinated um, with her first dose. So there's just not the restrictions are weird in the supply. Well, we, we were getting, you know, the vaccine tourists, right? So we had people getting on their $80,000 per one way ticket on a private jet from Canada, New York, flying in, getting their vaccine and heading out of town. So they finally put a stop to that. But oh we God. are also having a significant issue. I can't even vaccinate the cops. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, today at my site, I had a judge, I had a audiologist. So something screwed up essentially with the system. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the um, this happened, uh, Mar our buddy Mark Escott, um, who just, mm -hmm. boy, talk about bad timing. He agreed to step in as the interim public health authority for Austin Travis County, and then COVID hit. So mm -hmm. he's really not an EMS doc anymore. He's doing public health almost exclusively. Wow. And uh, so, you know, they're getting him on TV constantly. And a big thing that happened here was the governor threw a hissy fit and said, um, and in hindsight, y'all may know I'm not a huge fan of our governor, but I think this one was probably understandable. Um, he gets a report that says, you know, half of all vaccine or more, even available for the first dose is sitting on shelves. It's not being used. They're hoarding it or something. And he says, well, hell with that. Open it up to one B's now. Just open the floodgates and go. And Mark had this wonderful uh, interview where he's saying, the problem is our data sucks. Mm -hmm. We've made it so challenging to document giving these doses that they're backlogged. We don't have vaccines sitting on shelves. We can't get it. It's not that we're not using it. So, you know, I was listening to a, a morning edition piece um, this morning, yesterday morning, where it was talking about how ironic it is that we can't get there's this big backlog. We can't get enough vaccine, but it's also all sitting on the shelves. And I just wonder how much of that is an issue nationally too. Well, <clears throat> I can tell you that we have the most sophisticated vaccine in the world and we're still like Fred Flintstone with the back office part of it. And so at my site, we have people, old people printing out paper, fin filling it in and then bringing it into my site. And then we have to take that paper 
courier it over to a building where there's people who used to be contact tracers, then fill in that information. And so obviously we, I mean, wow. you would think that we had a year to prepare for this type of thing. And here we are flat on our faces in an embarrassing way. So yeah. no vaccine, no back office, and it's all kind of gone to hell at this point in time. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. on that good, good, good note. Hey, it looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like somebody's here. Oh, Mark is there. Oh, he's there. Let me wait for him to get finished up here, and then we'll we'll just get to the topic here. Let me, uh, I got to oh, do a couple of things here. Do one of these. Hey. There he is. Hello. Hey, guys. Well, hi. Welcome, man. What's up, Mark? Hey, what's up? This well, is fun. I, uh, I hear you had um, quite the unfortunate little kiddo. Well, everything's so far working out, though. We're going to Good. get something done right away about it. And by the way, I was not going to intubate with ketamine in that case. Oh, <laughs> come on. I was setting you up for the ketamine intubation. Did you see, my, did you see the image I texted you? No. Oh, I see it now. Yeah, I see it now. Yee. I thought oh. that one. Through. I thought that one through and thought maybe not this time. Oh wow! wow. Yeah. Was uh, was he having some ataxia? Uh, yeah, mostly headache. He was at, the fascinating thing was he's still talking to me. So he's going to go get that. Uh, go to MR. We gave him some meds and calmed it down with some steroids and stuff. And then we're going to give him the MRI and straight to the OR. So. See what happens, but yeah, I did not have uh, to invoke. I did not have to invoke ketamine on this one. So, well, you know, maybe patient selection is important, right? Hey, it is actually in dose. <laughs> <It's> actually, <laughs> dose is important too. Yeah, interesting. Well, so uh, Dr. Peel, we've been kind of going around the room, and we've been actually commiserating about vaccines um, yeah. because no matter what the topic of our podcast, this is the rule for 2020. And it seems to be bleeding over into 2021. No matter what the topic, it's going to end up on COVID yep. at some point in the conversation. So um, we were actually just stalling for you. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Who are you and what do you do? Um, I am a pediatric intensivist and I'm a medical director for a critical care transport team here in Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm... Um, I, I know all you guys, probably not as Mike as well as Jeff and, and Peter, but I one of my claims to fame, I would say, is knowing and appearing on a podcast with both Peter and, and Jeff and now Mike. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I love teaching and practicing critical care and emergency uh, pediatrics. I love airway management and thinking about how to do it better. And Jeff, you and I have debated this concept of using ketamine alone for a while. So when, yeah. when uh, Pete yesterday said, could I join? I was excited to do it. And um, yeah, that's me. Well, I think, uh, you know, we've kind of built this as a, as a knockdown drag out fight, which is great to get people to watch. Yeah. Um, and I certainly don't want to just give it away early that we probably agree more than we disagree now. So just forget I said that. Um, but I think you actually uh, threw the gauntlet down first at Fast 19. That's right. Um, yeah. Where you started talking shit when you were the only one with a microphone. So right. well done. Well done. Right. right. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I got, I got, I got quite a bit of uh, interesting mixed feedback on that concept. So it'll be, it'll be great to go through some data today and talk about how to actually make it work. Absolutely. I, yep. Dr. Peel actually sent me the picture that he took all the shit for. Let's see if I can get it to, you won't be able to see it, but basically in the background, it says deep sedation, intubation, ketamine. This is a high tech podcast right here. <laughs> and high flow nasal cannula. Boom. That was the gauntlet right there. There you go. That's all you need. <laughs> so right, when you said, just to clarify, say that again, Mikey. It was ketamine, VL, high flow nasal cannula, get the job done. So would you clarify for us what you mean by high flow nasal cannula? Boy, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> some, way, some way of increasing supplemental uh, oxygen to the maximum you can. So I tend to think of like two per kilo of flow in a child, two mils, uh, two liters per minute of flow in a child up to about 20 is what I usually, is what I usually do. So I know you guys max out your high flows a lot higher. 
40, 60 liters. And I wouldn't hesitate to do that, but I, I'm usually going up to about 20, maybe 30 as the, as the, as the pre-oxygenation and, um, apneic. I don't use, I don't use apneic oxygenation cause we don't make them apneic because we don't paralyze typically, Good but, point. uh, they're breathing that high flow the whole time. Yeah. So the, the key clarification though, for, um, our folks in the field is we're not talking about the run of the mill nasal cannula that we have on most of our ambulances. Correct. But if that's all you have, I'd still feel comfortable using that for the short term. It's not humidified and warm, mm. but if you have a child or a patient who is um, obtunded or has been given ketamine, I think they'll tolerate that 15 liters of flow pretty well uh, in the short term. Do you guys agree with that? Oh, absolutely. As I yeah. use it at whatever it goes to. We um, say how much. Yeah, we say even with rock uranium. So, yeah. yeah, I'm a huge apneic oxygenation fan. Good. Absolutely. So Mikey, you want to do the rounds, everybody, other than Dr. Peel? Um, we got the most important question of the day, and then we'll roll that beautiful bean footage. Yeah, that sounds good. So we'll start with Peter. What are you drinking, buddy? Well, today I got an old fashioned, um, mm. which is kind of, uh, it's called slow and low. It's kind of, oh, yeah. it's got the mix in the bottle. Yeah. And so all I got to do is add some ice and um, someone, someone bought it for me uh, right before COVID. And I swear to God, every time I order Instacart, the lady looks at me funny. Uh, she thinks there's an alcoholic living in the house, but um, it goes so fast. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's good. And uh, Jeff, what do you got? So I have a, it's a, it's an old fashioned with bourbon only, <laughs> uh, otherwise known as neat bourbon. I'm drinking like Buffalo it. Trace tonight. I like it. Nice. That's good. good, That's good. This is my cough, my Starbucks <laughs> beer that I'm enjoying. That's no Starbucks. Come on. I was well, going to say, yeah, that's an old Zoom trick. Everybody knows that. Just hold up your coffee. Ooh, oh, this is hot, right? And you chug it down. I know how that goes. That, that looks uh, like hospital Starbucks. That's right. I have to tell you, my, my hospital Starbucks is the instant little packets I oh, dump in the hospital. Yeah. That's how uh, I do it. Uh, okay. Our, our store, so when we opened, our, I was working at our community hospital when we opened it, and we proudly served Starbucks, like the real thing, real Starbucks. And then I think an MBA somewhere figured out what they were paying for that. And our Starbucks now is on a good day, Folgers. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to set some via there, Jeff. Let me tell yeah. you. I need to do that. I need to do that. Start, Mike, start what you set your back uh, some some dough there. I mean, if you, you you go there just you buy a couple of drinks and I mean you're in for twenty bucks. Easy. Huh. Rip. Mikey, what do you got? I've got uh, I've got a diet Pepsi and a little Maker's One Hundred and One tonight. Yeah. So, hats off to this little little hat tip to Kentucky. I'm heading there to go hang out with old uh, Eric Bauer and my kid this week. So uh, I'll be there Wednesday through Monday and. Uh, we'll see. They're having massive thunderstorms right now. Like I keep getting all these warnings on my phone, like seek shelter. Like it's coming. It's the end of the world kind of flood shit going on. So oh, God, yeah, hey, well, awesome. listen, Mike, if you get there and you hear an RV and something coming out of the RV, run the other way. Okay, right? Copy that. I heard Not about sure. that. Yeah. I'm just going to drive straight out of town, head <laughs> to Kentucky, straight North. All right, good. So we're going to, as usual, guys. So Dr. Jarvis has a pre-recorded piece. He's going to talk about the topic of the night. He's going to discuss some literature. That's going to be about. I cut it down a little bit, just because there's a the actual video will go on YouTube as well. So it's got the intro and the outro. We didn't need that for this particular thing. So it's a little bit shorter, and then we will come back and we will discuss it. So panelists. You guys got about 15 minutes to sort of uh, chat with the folks. So we'll be in there and uh, let me get this video going. So give me just a second. I got to do one of these. And this is my usual spiel. I, I talked to you. A little it. of this, a little of that. Yeah, exactly. All right. Stand by. I suspect that my patient population is similar to your patient population. There are enough people out there eating enough cheeseburgers to make McDonald's a very profitable company. Hold that thought. Note to self. Check McDonald's morning start. There we go. They're trading at 213. They got a morning star fair market value, 230, 230. Wow. 
I may actually have to take a closer look at a company I quit eating at about 15 years ago. Wow. Good to know. Anyway, let's face it. Our adult population is often pretty chunky. A lot like I was when, say, I was eating a lot at McDonald's. And while sadly we're seeing more and more childhood obesity, most children are not anatomically challenging intubations. And perhaps that's the reason that my pediatrician friends are fond of a ketamine-only approach. To be fair, though, it's not just pediatricians advocating ketamine-only intubations. When discussed in the adult population, most folks will advocate its use in a very limited and specific subset of patients. And though I'm not, uh, yeah. and although I'm not a fan, I might use this approach in the right patient. Now, the classic patient that might be a good fit for a ketamine-only approach is one with multiple difficult airway characteristics, both anatomic and physiologic. For example, let's take an obese male with limited neck mobility, a bloody airway from, say, mandibular trauma. And just to make things fun, let's throw in a history of oxygen-dependent COPD who's hypoxic despite high-flow oxygen on a non-rebreather. And what the hell, let's give him COVID too, just to be fun. Now, the concern here is that paralysis is going to remove his ability to clear blood and secretions and it's going to relax the soft tissues, leading to occlusion of his airway. Now, his physiology, his body habitus, his persistent hypoxia mean that his safe apnea time is going to be measured in seconds, not minutes. Perhaps dissociating him with ketamine will lead to sedation and some relaxation, allowing for instrumentation, but without taking away his ability to protect his airway. Perhaps. Now, another potential patient for this approach might be one in metabolic acidosis, say DKA or sepsis. This patient is likely to be acidotic and their tachypnea is the only thing keeping their pH from falling off a really, really steep cliff. Paralysis in this patient will take away that compensatory mechanism and may lead to a fatal acidosis particularly if once you get them intubated, you reset the vent at what normal would be as opposed to what compensatory is for them. Now, ketamine-only intubation in this patient population might allow for intubation with maintenance of spontaneous respiration and avoid that whole steep cliff thing altogether. Now, of these two examples, I am far more convinced by the second than I am the first. For the patient with the difficult airway, I think using only ketamine is going to lead to increased secretions and possible respiratory depression while doing nothing to make the intubation attempt easier. In fact, multiple papers, including a meta-analysis, have shown first-pass success is higher with RSI than without it. I really think using ketamine-only intubation because of difficult airway characteristics is getting the worst of both worlds. They can end up with respiratory depression without sufficient muscle relaxation to successfully intubate. And then you're just really in a bad situation. I do think in patients that I think I'm going to be able to intubate easily, ketamine-only approach might make sense in those compensated metabolic acidosis patients. And to be fair, I think this category probably describes the majority of patients that my pediatric colleagues are thinking of. So their approach might make more sense than I may let on. But me saying their opinion is reasonable isn't as much fun as a good debate. And plus, any day I get to call Peter an ignorant slut, that's a good day. By the way, that's an old SNL reference, just in case you missed it. Now, the other approach that's advocated, and I'm really a fan of, for patients with really difficult airways that we would prefer to avoid paralyzing, that's the awake intubation. Now, the classic patient for whom this is a good option is one being intubated for angioedema or that metabolic acidosis patient. Awake intubation involves anesthetizing the posterior airways with topical lidocaine or something like that, some topical substance. Now, perhaps a bit of sedation is also used, whether it's a benzodiazepine or maybe subdissociative ketamine but the patient is still awake. 
The patient is then intubated with their airway reflexes intact and they're still spontaneously breathing. Now, this doesn't relax the muscles, so it does require a cooperative patient. This approach is sometimes used in conjunction with fiber optic nasal intubations or fiber optic intubations, period. What we really need, though, is some evidence on ketamine-only intubations. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, this is a literature-based podcast, so let's talk some literature. Dr. Brian Driver and his colleagues published this paper titled Success and Complications of the Ketamine-Only Intubation Method in the Emergency Department. It came online December of 2020 in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. Now, this is a retrospective analysis of data collected in the NEAR registry. Now, we've discussed some other papers from NEAR in prior pods. NEAR is the National Emergency Airway Registry. It's comprised of 26 academic emergency departments. Physicians, most commonly emergency medicine residents, will complete a comprehensive data collection survey following each intubation describing in detail what they did. Now, there are a variety of quality control mechanisms at each site, and the Data Coordination Center also helps assure high-quality data. Now, I just like to take this point to say I really, really want an analogous airway registry for pre-hospital medicine. We so need something like this. Now, this study only included adult patients intubated in the emergency department between January 16 and December 2018, and they defined adults here as those over 14. They excluded patients intubated for cardiac or respiratory arrest and those with missing data on their primary outcome. Now, speaking of which, their primary outcome was first pass success, and secondary outcomes include first pass success without adverse events and the overall rate of adverse events. They broke all of these patients into three buckets. Bucket number one was ketamine-only intubations. These patients had dissociative dose ketamine without any paralytic. Bucket number two was topical anesthesia. These had topical anesthetic without a paralytic. Now, some of these received sedation as well and may have even included ketamine, but it was subdissociative ketamine. And this is what most of us would think about as an awake intubation. And then finally, bucket number three was RSI. These were the classic sedative plus paralytic. They were primarily interested in comparing ketamine-only intubation with topical intubation, but they threw in RSI as a reference because it's so prevalent and it's the most common approach to intubation in the emergency department. They ended up with 12,511 patients, and of these, only 102 or 0.8 percent were ketamine-only, and even less, 80 or 0.6 percent were topical. The overwhelming majority, 98%, were RSI. And this really goes to show how prevalent RSI is in emergency department intubations, as well as how rare ketamine-only intubations are. Now, if you're looking at the characteristics, the classic table one, patients in the two non-RSI groups were more obese and had more difficult airway characteristics than the RSI group. And this really suggests that these two groups or these three groups were not the same. It strongly suggests that the treating physician picked their approach to airway management for a reason, and difficult airway may have been that reason. So what did they find? Well, first pass success was highest with RSI at 90%. Topical first pass was 85, and ketamine only was 65 First pass success without adverse events was 83% with RSI, 78 with topical, and only 55 with ketamine only. Now, they also looked at just those patients with at least one difficult airway characteristic, and they did this in an attempt to help control for this indication bias that we're going to talk a little bit more about later. Now, in these patients, these ones with difficult airway characteristics, First pass success was 87% with RSI, 86% topical, 
but only 51% with ketamine only. And the most common change after a failed initial attempt in the two non-RSI groups was the conversion to RSI. So they added in a paralytic when at first their approach didn't work. Now, because I always have a hard time with numbers when I'm listening to a podcast, let me summarize these results. RSI had higher first pass success. It was done far more often and had more first pass success without adverse events. In just the two non-RSI groups, topical or awake intubation was much better than ketamine-only intubation. Now, basically, this paper is really, really bearish on ketamine-only approach, meaning they don't like it. And since that was my bias going in, I think I like this paper. It's important to point out limitations of any paper, though. The biggest, and this is really, really hard to overcome with this paper, is indication bias. This wasn't an RCT. There was almost certainly a reason the treating physicians decided to use the strategy they did so that the patients weren't the same in the different groups. Most likely, they used ketamine only or a topical approach on patients they predicted would be very hard to intubate or wouldn't tolerate paralysis. They did a sensitivity analysis because of this where they looked at only those with difficult airway characteristics and if anything, that made the ketamine-only approach even worse. Now, most papers would try to do some type of regression analysis where they control for difficult airway characteristics. Now, unfortunately, the numbers for the ketamine-only or topical intubation routes were just so low that they didn't think it was statistically appropriate. It's what my friend Dr. Rimley Crow might call statistical fuckery. And because nobody wants to get on Rimley's bad side, I'm really glad they didn't do that. So what's my bottom line? I think this paper reinforces my preconceived notion that ketamine-only intubation is really just a procedure in search of an indication. And I like papers that agree with me. Now, there are certainly some patients for whom paralytic intubation isn't a great option. And for these I think an awake intubation using topical anesthetic is a better option, and this paper would seem to support that. Now, ultimately, this paper really doesn't provide great evidence because of the indication bias limitation, but it's about the best evidence we have at the moment. An RCT that would control for indication is really needed to help answer this question. Now, I hope you all read this paper because it has a really nice discussion in it. It is behind a paywall, but if you drop me an email, pretty sure I can find a way to help you out here. I hope y'all are staying safe and keeping afloat in what I hope will at the very minimum be the beginning of the end of this pandemic. I've now had both of my COVID vaccine shots, and I hope y'all have too. I'm actually feeling more optimistic than I have any time since pretty much March of last year. Guys, thank you all for listening, and most importantly, thank you for doing what you do. It's important work. All right, we are back from the video, and uh, there's been a wardrobe change. <laughs> well, there has. So I was looking at the comments in there, and I noticed that my buddy Dr. Pickett is there. And uh, he was just all ready to talk some shit so about me not wearing a tie. So I had to go put a tie on. So you'll notice that I have a tie on, a jacket. You won't notice the jeans and boots, but it's Texas, so I think I'm still good. The old Texas tux. Well, the Texas tux are real tux, but with boots. Oh, okay. That was, that was the last one. All right. Well, that's fair enough. All right. Uh, well, there it was. So, gentlemen, I think I tried to be fair. I think I tried to point out that, you know, you might have um, a reason, albeit, you know, wrong for doing what you do. So I, I got to flap my gums. I'll give you your um, chance. Why don't you make your case for the ketamine-only intubation? So, uh, Jeff, first of all, th this kind of reminds me of the, of the papers that the American Heart Association uses to make changes to the PALS guidelines. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Damn. Well, as opposed to the extensive literature that you have to support ketamine only? <laughs> so, 
I mean, look at look at the numbers here, Jeff. I have I have the numbers here right in front of me. So yep. you're talking about a paper that had, and, and you mentioned this already, twelve thousand three hundred and twenty nine cases versus a hundred and two ketamine only. Absolutely. So, so what happened to the old RCT requirement and maybe doing a Monday, Tuesday, like Marianne Gachet Hill did back in 1999. I mean, why, why, you know, why are we doing real research here instead of just picking out patients? It's clearly selection bias here, right? So Amber picked it out very nicely and that obviously they're only going to be picking patients who, you know, are not as simple intubation. And if you look at the numbers here, um, take a look at here, the initial impression of a difficult airway in the RSI group, 30%. Yep. The initial impression of a difficult airway for the ketamine only group, 75% and 90 for the topical anesthesia part. So, you know, obviously, you know, you're either running a 5k or you're running a marathon, right? Mar you know, Mark's, Mark's a runner. So he, he knows. And so are you, Jeff, actually. So and neither one of us get that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a runner. Okay. okay. So, so, so obvi obviously you're going to have a difference in outcomes when you're, when you're picking out patients who are more difficult and you're picking out patients who obviously for some reason required uh, ketamine only. Let me further say out of 102 patients, only four of those patients were intubated by a non-trainee. Four out of 102 were intubated by a non-trainee. And that's, uh, that's on uh, page number four. Now, yes, in the RSI group, there were, you know, about the same amount of patients who were, you know, remember, these are all intubated by, by trainees. But if you're a PGY1, 2, 3, a fellow, you've intubated a million times. And I'll bet you, you've probably never done, unless you work with Mark, uh, a ketamine-only intubation. If you, if you ever see, you know, Mark has put out some videos on this, ketamine only with VL, it, it requires a little bit of, a, you know, a savvy and you have to have some experience with it. You can't just bring in the PGY3 and say, hey, buddy, here's a kid. Um, go ahead and do a ketamine only intubation because obviously you cannot manipulate the structures as you would normally do with RSI where you have these people just jamming up left and right. I mean, you have to be able to, you know, go in the hyperangulated blade, know exactly where your equipment is, and then just slide that tube right in through the vocal cords. And so, you know, I'll let Mark talk about that. But you remember what Marianne did in 1999 is that she went to Calif in California and she gave a three hour session on intubation to paramedics who had never intubated before. That study went on for three years kind of similar to this study here. And so you, you could have been a paramedic on year three who got a three hour training three years ago. And then we wonder why the paramedics couldn't intubate when they were given the opportunity to do so. So let's kind of be sure here that we're talking apples to apples and uh, Mark, I'll tee that one up for you to take away. Great. Thanks. So Jeff, what's most helpful just kind of describe my general, arguments here or technique or what's the yeah oh. you bet so you can um you can do whatever you like so you can talk about your technique and why you think it's a good one or yeah. you can go full-on obfuscation and fake news like peter did yeah. um, to try to distract from the lack of evidence for right. his approach so, so it's completely your your point so first whatever of all, you'd like to do. I, I did like the paper. I appreciate this paper. And it, it does arm you, Jeff Jarvis, with some ammunition to say that Peter and I are wrong. Some ammunition. By the way, but that is selection bias, not what Peter was talking about. So you're right. This was clear. Me picking the paper was clearly selection bias. <laughs> so the headline is ketamine only intubation doesn't work, right? That's the takeaway. So let's dig in a little bit and think about what might have been done differently. And I'll, and I'll give you a couple disclaimers. I practice pediatric critical care. I'm in the trauma room. I'm in the ED a lot and have the privilege of doing lots of intubations. And um, however, I don't take care of your population in general. I certainly sure have a lot of kids that are the size patient that you guys manage, but not the age. Uh, so let me give that disclaimer. And this concept came to me uh, around 
uh, a difficult trauma patient who had both difficult anatomy because of injury and physiology. And so my thought was, uh, as, as was the thought probably of many of 100 patients in this study, this is not going to go well if I don't get it on the first try and this patient stops breathing and becomes hypoxemic. And so is there a way outside of our standard approach that we've learned since the 70s, RSI or modified RSI, is there some other way to better manage that patient's anatomy and physiology? And, and a sedation only technique is often thought of. I would argue, Jeff, you mentioned in your monologue there's tons of studies that show that better intubating conditions occur with RSI versus not, but probably none of those used a combination of adequate ketamine dosing or ketamine at all and video laryngoscopy. So I'd say those are two new features in the old literature that I don't think we really can refer to. So this is really the one study that we have to point to. And um, yes, I agree with the selection bias uh, issue. 100 out of 12,000 is a small amount and probably indicated that there was something super scary about these individual patients. And I also agree with Peter that the level of training was skewed towards the lower end. And that's not, an, by the way, that doesn't help our cause if you have to have the most experienced operator doing this technique, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, not useful in certain situations. Um, so my typical approach that Mike showed on the Twitter uh, page was, is I've, I've learned to lean towards a higher dose of ketamine, number one, to use a blade that is hyperflexed so that it follows the patient's anatomy much better and doesn't cause distortion of the tissues and is not as much of a noxious stimulus as a typical DL blade, which none of us should be using ever in our lives again. But is I'm sorry. Could you just go ahead and say that again for me? I, I didn't hear that. What was that? I, I think direct laryngoscopy is probably a thing of the past and should go away. But I'm I'm not going to make a bunch of clean arguments on which type of VL you should be using. But I would say hyperflex blade intuitively manages the curvature of the of the tongue and airway a lot better than a standard geometry. Mark, I think um, you're just sucking up to me now. <laughs> You are spot on on that. And so if you note in the, um, in the study, the, I think the median dose of ketamine was 1.3 milligrams per kilo in the, um, in the laryngoscope only group. And with the topical, wasn't it Peter a little less than that? I think yeah. it was in the 0.7 range. <clears throat> I was, if correct. Yep. Right. right. Yeah. So each of us on this call have probably been in situations where we needed to use more ketamine for some purpose, a painful procedure, an agitated patient, or in my case, an airway management. So let's just park that one and say, is it possible that these patients didn't get enough ketamine to allow their uh, laryngoscopy to happen? Number two, half of the ketamine-only intubations occurred with a standard geometry blade. It was almost evenly divided between the two, meaning they used an inadequate technique, I believe, that would have required sometimes actually paralysis to see around that curve and get the tube in place. And, um, and then the non trainee those were, those were kind of my nope. bullets that I wanted to mention that might have been drawbacks to this study. Yeah, I wait, think, Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark. I think I think we have to put an emphasis on what you just said because I think that you know for at least, at least for people like Jeff who, who don't maybe don't understand the pediatric world that one per kilo of ketamine is nothing zippo yeah. nada for this type of procedure number one and I completely agree with you that you cannot use a standard blade for this procedure so if I told you Jeff that I'm going to teach you how to play tennis I'm going to give you a two by four you're going to suck at it my friend okay so this is wrong tools. Wrong dose of medication, different patient population, and then we wonder why you're not, you know, a great tennis player today. Right. right? So there you go. And, and so since I need to provide Dr. Jarvis with data, and I don't have a ton of it, to be fair, but there is a – we are my hospital where I am at this moment is a near-for-kids site participant. So, Jeff, you – your dream is that there would be such a thing as near for EMS, which would be awesome. But the Absolutely. near for kids is the pediatric national database of airway management. It just, it's actually a, largely a pick you, not ED thing, but it needs to move into the ED and is doing so now. And ideally EMS as well. But the 
the most one of the most recent near for kids studies on ketamine that was to be fair not looking at non paralyzed intubations showed that there were fewer hemodynamic adverse events with ketamine and the larger the dose the better they did so 3.5 per kilo was the largest quartile in which there were fewest adverse events so three times at least as much as what we're looking at in this study and surely in adults there's a there's a leveling off you can't just per kilo dose it forever and ever in your 500 pound patient but i think in general what i'd argue is if you want to preserve physiology and that means hemodynamics and oxygenation you use sufficient ketamine you resuscitate before you intubate with enough volume pre intubation and you maintain a flow of 100% oxygen the only way to do all those three things is to use ketamine and not paralyze the patient. And I'm not even talking about the ac acidemic patient, the ones with the PCO2 that are already high, all the other things you mentioned, Jeff. I think there's a physiologic rationale that makes sense for intubating someone while they're breathing, and I can tick off 10 different cases for you if helpful. But uh, the question is, is it a scalable, is this a scalable technique for EMS in particular? I would argue in some, some ways it is, and two, what are the exact elements that are best, that will best facilitate it, and how does this study help us uh, uh, advocate for or against it? So I'll stop there for the moment, but I have I have a lot more to say, but I want to I don't want to I don't want to monopolize the, the entire show here. Well, um, thank you for saying that. I think that you make a couple of points that, are, that I think are really good, um, and I'm just dying to make them. But Mikey. Yeah, you seem to have, you seem to have done something here. <laughs> there is there is an anomaly in the force. What what have you done? Well, <laughs> you know there was a lot of discussion about Pickett, and so I texted him. I said, "You want to jump on?" He's like, "Hell yes, I want to jump on." <laughs> and so here he is. Hi. This is. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Mikey. Brought, he was a little worried here that uh, you know the Peds guys were ganging up on me. So <laughs> he needed. I I felt like I needed another big. Person. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear some feedback here. So wow. <laughs> I, I like. Big I went ahead and got a tie on because you know I was afraid Pickett might show up. <laughs> I can't <laughs> let him down. Welcome Pickett in the, in the chat. Um, so, well, I, in a, a adult world's different from pediatric world, but, uh, I am going to mention some data from, uh, our, our good friend, Henry Wang. Uh, the, uh, uh, if, uh, Jeff, if you're the airway evangelist, um, uh, he's, he's the one I think that, uh, that actually like chips out the 10 commandments and, in, uh, in stone, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a 2003 study of multivariate predictors of failed pre-hospital endotracheal intubation. Uh, is from uh, uh, academic emergency medicine. Uh, in there, uh, the of um, the uh, of failed intubations in, uh, in the field, uh, nearly fifty percent were attributable to inadequate relaxation. Um, Twenty percent poor anatomy, ten percent uh, to obstruction. Uh, those patients who couldn't be intubated in the field, 41% were successfully intubated in the ED after RSI. Now, obviously, you've got different providers there, right? You've got different, uh, potentially a different provider skill. Um, but uh, the, you know, at least in that study, their their uh, estimate of difficult intubation attempt of difficult airways, um, meaning three or more intubation attempts in the ED, was, uh, was less than two percent. Uh, so it was, it was pretty small. Now we like ketamine. I, 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 ketamine is uh, such an incredibly useful drug and, and uh, I love it for sedation and for management of the agitated person uh, because I don't want to intubate them. And we like ketamine because it preserves airway reflexes and preserves airway protection. Uh, so um, one of the things that the patient's trying to protect their airway from is me, you know, like you know, protect them from my laryngoscope uh, or my glide scope or wh whatever that is. So um, logically, it doesn't, uh, except under certain circumstances. And Mark, I, I absolutely agree that there are uh, that there are those cases that uh, ketamine only intubation is is, uh, is the way to go. I've done it myself on a, a angioedema who was bleeding in the ED and, and growing hypoxic. Uh, so. I think there are cases, but I think really that um, I I don't like it. I think it's setting us up for failure because we do see people so we do see people get apneic after ketamine, uh, mm -hmm. and we do see them get hypopneic. And especially you have somebody who's working to breathe and they're trying and they're trying and they're working, and now we take that some of that drive from them by just chilling them out. Uh, now we're kind of at a halfway point where we can't necessarily 
position them as as ideally as we would like to and and they've lost a lot of that self positioning uh, i would rather just go the whole hog and and paralyze them and intubate them so I think there are a couple of things that there are a couple of things that we've been dancing around a lot. And this is actually one of the reasons I really wanted to bring the two of y'all on. Um, I think we are talking about fundamentally different populations. And I think that's really important. Y'all are talking about a pediatric population. And for the most part, we're not. Um, the vast, vast majority of people that we intubate are adults. Um, and as a matter of fact, in my system, I don't let my medics intubate pediatrics because we do it so incredibly infrequently. So I think they are different patient populations. And one thing that's interesting, I think most, even though sadly enough, there are an awful lot, an increasing number of really chunky kids. And I think that's very, very sad. Most kids anatomically aren't going to be that challenging physiology may be completely different, particularly in the population that you're dealing with, Mark. Um, so I think whereas with adults, we have an awful lot of anatomic challenges that if you paralyze them, you may um, make your problems worse. So theoretically, that's the case with adults. The challenge is, is when you look at the data, it says that you are far more likely to have a first pass success when you paralyze them. You do exactly what Pickett just said. You go whole hog and go for it. Now, so number one is, uh, I think we're talking about different patients. And in this paper, they specifically excluded pediatric patients. This was adults only. And they're talking about every, the difference between adults and pediatrics is clearly um, arbitrary. I mean, half of the people on this podcast are, are still pediatrics, uh, myself included. But the, and I may be the oldest person on the pod. Um, but this paper is only about adults. And uh, Peter, so you mentioned that this paper, um, it's not an RCT. It's not like what Marianne did um, in Los Angeles. And just to be clear, you said those parents, uh, patients or paramedics had never intubated before. That's not true. They had been intubating since Johnny and Roy. They just had not been intubating kids. Correct. And again, it's a different population. Um, whether they were intubating adults well or not, considering the time at the time, I don't think anybody was intubating adults well in the field um, as a system. Individuals, so don't don't send me hate mail. Individuals, I'm sure y'all are all individually above normal. Amazing, amazing. So um, the other issue is um, clearly indication bias here is huge and you can't get around that. Um, that is a massive limitation to this. So this paper is definitely not data. Um, this, well, that's not true. It's some data, uh, but it's not RCT data and you just can't get around that indication. You are absolutely right. When you talk about the difference in, um, the proportion of patients with at least one difficult airway characteristic. There's no doubt a reason that the physicians decided to intubate these patients differently. Um, now, keep in mind, there were two approaches to non-RSI intubation. There was what I think most of us would call an awake intubation, mm -hmm. which is topicalization with um, lidocaine or you know some anesthetic, topical anesthetic, and then sub-dissociative doses of either ketamine or Versed or nothing, uh, and ketamine only in dissociative doses. So two, two different approaches to the non-RSI. And what you notice in those two groups is there's still a distinct difference. In the topicalization group, first pass success was still markedly higher than it was in the ketamine only group, even outside of RSI. Now, RSI was still better, period. The other thing to note is in those patients who had a non-RSI intubation or an attempt but failed, what was the number one thing that they did to succeed on the second attempt? They paralyzed the patient. Mm. So they reverted to RSI. Yeah. And then finally, you mentioned um, that the there were so few of these patients with ketamine only that were intubated by non-attendings there was actually a larger percentage of them intubated by attendings than there were in the RSI group. 
and this isn't surprising, this near is 26 academic emergency departments. Right. Attendings barely ever intubate. Right. Um, there's a reason that it's predominantly um, trainees, but it was the same rate of trainees across all groups. Right. So um, the final thing that I wanted to mention about it, um, I wanted to talk about two things. Uh, one of my medics had posted a question in the chat. He said, well, does first pass success, which is the primary outcome in this paper that we're so focused on, does it even matter if the patient is still breathing? And I think that's a really interesting question because what we care about, so I don't really care, and I have to be careful about how I say this because it's so easy to be taken out of context. I don't care about first pass success as long as we maintain um, the physiology of the patient. Right. But what we know is that if you miss on the first attempt, you very rarely maintain the physiology of the patient. They're related. So if we don't let them desaturate, we don't let them get hypotensive, then yeah, it probably doesn't matter. But as we're mucking around in an airway and we're trying to get this intubation, they're more likely to become hypoxic, the thing we worry about. Dr. Peel's dying to get in. Go for he it. He is. He is. And then well, I got I, a question for him. By I, the way. I, I was on mute, Jeff. I would have interrupted you three times before. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, unless they just keep breathing on their own and you have time to think about it. And so my question is, and I would be curious about uh, my adult friend's impressions here, is is it possible that we, use, that we underdose those patients and that all the things you're discussing, the intubating conditions, the relaxed jaw, the ability of the patient to tolerate the laryngoscope, the time you have to take a look while they're breathing fresh oxygen and maintain their ventilation. Is it possible that the, the dose was inadequate? That in your study, which is awesome, by the way, that people were hesitant about this approach and we took, took a wimpy dose approach to it and just didn't give them a good slug of 200 per kilo, 200 of ketamine or three or four per kilo. And um, I'm, I'm interested in you guys' impression of that because it's what I have developed as the only way to make it work. And Jeff, to your point about apnea, you have to give it slow enough that you don't cause apnea. Okay, right. at least in at least in adolescence. No, but I think that's that's true in adults too. We could all be taking care of the same. We could all be taking care of the same twenty-year-old severe trauma patient with hypotension, difficult airway, blood in the airway. And, and, and that's where maybe we can meet in the middle and say, is there a role there for that type of patient not making them uh, apnea? So I'd be curious about you guys' feedback on that one. And, and, then, and, then, and then also, Jeff, I want you to comment on this, is that you, know, you guys keep talking about pediatrics, but you know, in my systems where we use DSI, thanks to you, and quite truthfully, we're not using ketamine-only intubation. It's only the specific patient, so the severe asthmatic who I don't want to take away that patient's negative pressure, which is pulling open that RV and allowing that uh, that ventricle to fill, which is allowing the cardiac output to continue. Yes. And so the the the, the what, what I have uh, put into place, and we, we do about in an agency where we have about fifteen thousand call volume, we do about twenty DSIs a year, and you know um, maybe about twenty percent of those where we cannot intubate for whatever reason. Um, we'll just use ketamine and they'll abort, but then they'll abort and throw an eye gel down. And so that's been successful as well. So just because you're, you're using ketamine, um, and again, this is all adult patients now, then it doesn't mean that you also can't use, you know, DSA. And so you're actually using, um, a supraglottic. So when we're talking about EMS and people obviously listen to this are in EMS now, um, we should maybe even consider that that you know um option as well and you know maybe not using the paralytic right away and only if you have to at a later time so that's kind of how my protocol reads so that we allow the ketamine pause for those three minutes and then if things aren't going well i gel so what, what are your thoughts about that as well on top of what mark asked yeah so my we do that also um we just that's actually when we do rsi um if we can't get the SATs up, if we can't truly resuscitate right. before we intubate, if we can't meet our markers, then we don't push the uh, paralytic and intubate. Right. Now, we'll drop an eye gel. And if we need a paralytic to drop the eye gel because of masseter tone, then great. Go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, we're using two milligrams per kilogram. Um, 
I think the interesting, there is something that I really wanted to hit on about um, the dosing. Because what you were saying, Mark, if I understood you, is the, the prelim data from your registry is showing that there is less hemodynamic compromise with higher doses there, than there is in lower doses. Did I understand okay. that correctly? Right. Okay. In, in looking at hemodynamic associated adverse events, so hypotension, cardiac arrest, the fewest occurred in the patients who received the highest dose in the intraquartile range dose there was 3.5 per kilo closer to what I'm talking about using. And so the thing that's interesting about that is that there is, and the paper that you sent me, the Ruben Strayer pair, uh, paper, which I was very pleased to see uh, referenced my, our DSI paper, so it must be a good one. Um, that was a great opinion piece. And one of the things that he mentions, and he's only talking about adults in that paper, and one of the things he mentions is in patients who are catecholamine depleted, so they have dumped, I mean, they've squeezed yeah. the crap out of their adrenals yeah. that ketamine can actually cause a little bit of hypotension. Um, and he's talking about backing off on the dosing. Now, I, I don't do that in my system because I think variation in practice is a real challenge. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to see, I think maybe we're talking about some physiologic differences where yeah. perhaps there's just more catecholamine reserve in yep. the patients that you're talking about. But just to, to make sure I'm not being cavalier, I don't ever give someone four kilo. I titrate it in, okay? Right. So I am giving them two per kilo and watching. I'm looking at the monitor. I'm looking at the kid. I'm seeing how they're doing. Okay, the mouth doesn't seem quite loose enough. I'm going to put my thumb in there. I'm going to give two more, one more. So this is not a one-size-fits-all bite means. I'm just suggesting that I don't know that the data that we have, even in this awesome paper, answers the question fully. Was adequate dosage used and the right type of device, the right type of laryngoscope blade used to make sure this actually worked? And, and Mark, and Mark, and, and you know, j just for reference, I use one per kilo all day long when I'm reducing a forearm, where I'm putting a shoulder back in, an elbow, whatever it is. And those kids are not st still, right? And the parents are sometimes like, well, what's going on here? Because I know that that procedure will take me like 10 seconds and I'm done. And then I can get that kid out of my emergency department quicker. Whereas if I gave him two per kilo, which I did in Pittsburgh all day long, that's what we did everyone with. Then those kids were out and they were really out. So the one per kilo and two per kilo difference uh, is not something to just kind of blink an eye at. It's, it's, no. it's a real difference in kids and I'm sure in adults as well. I was just grinning about that because um, I had a kid the other day that I needed to do a, do a lack repair on. And I didn't want to hand it off to my partner. I'm like, I'm going to get, I got to put this kid down. So I'm not going to just pawn this off to my partner, but I'll tell you what, we don't have a line just give him, you know, and I think I gave him four per kilo. Um, I am ketamine because, you know, I'll sew it up and they can recover him and I'll go ahead and leave. All right. <laughs> and uh, that kid just looked at that ketamine and went <laughs> <laughs> nothing. And I waited and I waited and I dosed him again and I went, all right, screw it. Just put an IV in. And then he went down. Um, that's, a hardcore so kid. A history right there. <laughs> that? that's a hardcore kid with a history right there. <laughs> exactly. Well, our patient population is a little seedy there, Pickett. So Pickett, what are your thoughts on this, man? Just real quick. Somebody had a question about, are you guys using, this as Peter and Mark, are you guys using ideal or actual body weight? Ideal. Um, ideal body weight is what I go by. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. So my thoughts are, uh, are still looking at all the, the data that we have on sedation only intubation. Now, granted your ketamine is, we're, we're paying a lot more attention to it now, but you look at what with Versed and with Atomidate, um, really poor intubating conditions, yeah. um, yeah. much lower success rates. Uh, I think that, um, in residency, maybe I got a little biased, like going up on the floor and doing intubations, the internal medicine docs were kind of afraid of paralytics. And so like, we'll just give them some atomidate and then they fail at it. And it was like, well, you know, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure to do a sedation only intubation, except under certain limited circumstances. You have that DKA patient that you really like yeah. you, you're yeah. forced to intubate, but um then then that's the time to consider that also if you have additional tools in your toolbox like uh fiber optic uh or you know some uh, 
pretty good. Uh, you're, you're not just sort of jamming it, uh, King vision in there. You've, you've got a video laryngoscope that, uh, that you're very, very practiced in. Uh, then I, I agree. I think it's good, but I, I I'm going to reach for the paralytics and, uh, even in cardiac arrest, I find that our patients are not completely relaxed and uh, could benefit from a little paralytic. Yeah, I just remember that all those data are pre-ketamine and low-dose ketamine. So I, just, to, just to make it a fair comparison, but I agree with you, the history is not a happy one of sedation only, right? I think it's a novel opportunity we have to think about higher-dose uh, ketamine with an appropriately bent hyperflexed video laryngoscope blade. I think that's that's the novel combination. Yeah, I, and I think, don't think it's well enough. So I think you're right about that. And I definitely think that moves over to adults. Um, I don't think anybody who's had this conversation with me would be surprised to know I'm a big fan of a hyperacute angled video scope for everybody. Um, but particularly in these people, because you can stay away from the gag reflex, stay away from the things that are going to gag them until the tube is going through. Um, so, yeah, I think that is an important point. And you raise a really good issue about um, most of the literature when we talk about sedation assisted. Absolutely. It's some something completely stupid, like two milligrams of Versed. Right. Um, I mean, I remember talking to Jay Kovar about this and he said two milligrams. Shit, I need five just to stop the shakes in the morning. You know? <laughs> so two is just hopefully inadequate. Right. And, and, Jeff, and just remember also that with ketamine, you know, obviously ketamine in and of itself causes laryngospasm, right? You just push it fast and you get laryngospasm. When you take a big metal blade and you shove it in someone's molecula, I think that causes laryngospasm too when you have ketamine on board. And so I think that unless you, you kind of understand the hyperangulated blade, unless you know exactly how to position that thing so that you can slide the tube in in the middle of this person still breathing, um, no one should be listening to this and thinking that, you know, doing um, VL ketamine only intubation is something that you can pick up tomorrow uh, with your eyes closed. I mean, th there is some skill required, but using a supraglottic airway, if you had to with ketamine only is something that obviously doesn't require that. But again, you would need higher doses of ketamine to really snow that patient in my opinion. Yeah, so um, I think that there is, I think there are patients for whom, um, and we mentioned these, and obviously I think we are talking about cherry picking. These are a really small proportion of all patients that we need to intubate. The vast majority, I think, are going to do great with RSI. I agree. I think that there are those patients that we might not want to paralyze. Um my take here is that probably a topicalized airway is is a better approach, um, particularly topicalized if you can do a fiber optic um, or a fiber optic nasal. Mm -hmm. You know, I think those might be better options, particularly for the one that, I mean, Pickett and I just are like, oh, God, please don't let that patient be mine. The one with the tongue out to here with angioedema, um, where good luck getting anything past that um, tongue. On the other hand, the good news is all that swelling's on the outside. The backside's a normal sized tongue. And if you get a hyperacute angle blade in there, if you can get it in there, you may be good. Uh, but that would be a great patient for a fiber optic nasal intubation. Um, so I do think that there are some, a small minority of patients selected appropriately who are appropriate for this. I just think I'd probably topicalize them, um, whether nebulized, do some nebulized lidocaine. Um, I know, uh, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, Kovacs likes to do lidocaine jelly actually on a popsicle stick and have them suck on that and let it go back in there. Um, I'm kind of leaning more towards nebulizing it. Jeff, my only comment there is that all that stuff adds complexity and risk of dosing error and all those other things. And who has a fiber optic scope immediately available? And maybe you do in your ED. I don't have it immediately available. I'm trying to find something that's uh, simple. We're not using four induction drugs. We're using one with rocket the ready. So just two things and then a blade. And so I love all these other fancy tricks with a bronchoscopy and topicalization and all that. But I don't think that is a, that's certainly not a scalable, applicable uh, technique. 
is there something just with ketamine and, and, and BL that is scalable, replicable, and safer? That's kind of my pursuit uh, to figure out. So I so here just talking EMS and talking my systems, I don't think that is scalable. Um, and there is a reason we do DSI on 100% of our intubations. I don't think that 100% of our patients need DSI. I think some of them come pretty close to well pre-oxygenated and even just a non-rebreather would probably be enough to do it. But I don't deal in probably. I want to do everything I can to absolutely um, maximize the pre-oxygenation and my medics just don't have enough experience for a variety of approaches. And that's the reason I wanna focus on one approach, making sure that they are as good as they can with that one approach. Um, and then making sure they have a backup of uh, an eye gel. I, I did have a question for Jason, which was I noted in the complications, the, really the only difference you saw in the complications that were noted was vomiting, higher with the ketamine only group. And did do you know if those were significant events enough to cause complications or was it just something that happened to be noted and it was a overcome with suctioning and paralysis or whatever the next step was? So they didn't mention it in the paper. Um, one interesting thing, at least in my experience, I haven't seen ketamine um, cause more vomiting. I've absolutely seen ketamine cause more secretions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and maybe I've just been lucky in, in the patients I'm using it in, I don't see vomiting. Um, I just kind of wonder if there's a, you know, it's, this is a registry, right? And there's a form that you fill out and their trainees filling out the form. And as much as they go through data validation, there's still the individual trainee has to figure out how to interpret the question and maybe they're marking vomiting as secretions. I, I don't know. And I'm not a near sight. So makes sense. No near for EMS. In my in my experience, the vomiting and ketamine doesn't come immediate. It's not immediate. It's when they're coming back out. That's when they're waking back up. So you know, not so um, much something I'm worried about in this this context. Right. Exactly. So I'll let Mark worry about that when he's waking him up. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. So if I'm you know if I'm doing an arm or something, I would sometimes give Zofran just so that we wouldn't have to clean up the mess when when I'm leaving the room. Right. So it's. Uh, Again, so it's interesting, 7% vomiting here comparatively to uh, 1%. Um, so that's one of the reasons I like paralytics. They can't vomit. And uh, it, it, if uh, it, if you've got them ramped up, their their stomach's not going to empty up that esophagus. Even, uh, even passively, uh, it's not going to do that. Uh, so um, another kind of safety notch for RSI. Yeah. And they also don't increase their gag reflex as you're suctioning them. That's right. And that is, you know, there's a big difference here. Most of the intubations, uh, most of the intubations I do in the emergency department are not that messy. Um, there's some secretions in there. There's some old lady funk that's been in there for a while, but really not that bad of stuff. On the other hand, um, field intubations are just the most disgusting things ever. There is so much crap in there um, in a lot of these airways. So um, you got to pretty aggressively, you got to go all decanto on them and really aggressively suction. And that can definitely cause some more vomiting um, if they still have a gag reflex. All right. Dr. Peel's got to bounce out of here real quick. Thanks for joining us, Doc. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any final comments there, Mark? No, thanks for inviting me. It's a privilege. And uh, it's going to take a lot, many more years and a lot more data for me to change change your mind, Jeff. But I, I'm going to keep working on it. So Actually, one RCT would make, you know, it goes a yeah. long way. It goes exactly. a long way. Well, I Thank hope you, hopefully uh, this thing will die down and we can have some good German food together again absolutely. soon. Yeah, I love it. All right. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, man. Take care. Hey. But, you know, guys, I want to say that, you know, Jeff, it's really great that you actually brought this paper up because, number one, there's a lot of people who, you know, get their get their information from the 280 characters on Twitter. Um, people would read this abstract and make a decision. But obviously, what you brought up, you know, yourself, JR, Mike, uh, and Mark as well, is that you really have to understand the data and kind of us exploring this data, understanding dosing, equipment, 
really understanding what type of patient selection. So this really is, is, is an easy paper to read. And I would say that it's just a nice paper for us to, to kind of explore why people need to really investigate and really read papers rather than just take the, the little bullet points. So kudos to you. I mean, I know that we tease each other a lot on this, but I'm, I'm in the same boat as you guys. It, th this should be reserved for the patient who, when you paralyze them, they will die. As much as you try, <laughs> the severe asthmatic for me, and I have this kind of in my protocols, I tell my medics, if you're ever going to intubate a severe asthmatic, give them the ketamine first and try to do it without paralyzing them. Unless you've maximized their fluids, you've maximized their pressure, and you've maximized intubating conditions, which you know how those are in the middle of the night. So, um, you know, I love this topic. Obviously, I'm not a, I'm not a ketamine only intubation all the time. But I think it's something we should have in our toolbox for sure. I, I think that case right there, the fascinating thing about that asthmatic um, who you're like, well, shit. Yep. I'm going to have to intubate him. Okay. Um, give him the ketamine because ketamine has this other really cool property. Um, it's a bronchodilator. Okay. So perhaps you won't have to intubate them. Yep. Um, put them on a ketamine drip. Absolutely. That, that's so, yeah, go ahead. Jay. So I saw. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to because I want to get your take on this. I, um, we have ketamine in our uh, in our clinical guidelines for bronchospasm. Uh, yet, in trying to look up the references, I can't find anybody that says what dose that should be. Should that be a dissociative dose? Should that be a sub dissociative dose? Uh, like, if you're intubating the patient, it's an obvious answer. And you've got somebody with severe bronchospasm. Yes, ketamine would be a great choice for facilitating intubation along with your paralytic. But what about the person that you're you're doing just ketamine straight up at, uh, for bronchospasm? What's the dose? I don't know, maybe, maybe nebulized. I mean, I've never used it in that particular case, uh, JR, but I can say that, um, I mean, it's a good, it's a great question, but maybe nebulized ketamine would be a, a good idea there. I'm not sure. The ones that I've had it in, I just went full on two per kilo. Um, I did a full dissociation and to be honest, I did it in preparation for intubation right. and sadly, ultimately they got intubated. Um, but it bought me a little bit of time and I'm all about getting more time before I have to tube somebody. Did it change your end title at all, Mar uh, uh, Jeff on that? Do you remember? I those? don't remember. And it's been a while. So my guess is we didn't have waveform capnography in the emergency department. I mean, it's, we had the little color metric thing and apparently that's all you need. Some, it, some hospitals still think that's the thing to use. By the yeah. Way. yeah. That was sarcasm, by the way. Um, it, it is true that we frequently, if I wanted to know what the end title was, I better get it while EMS is there. So sad. Yep. So I saw a, a question in the group that student, uh, let's see, Natalie says, future Dr. Natalie is asking about um, states that don't do, where was it? It was, uh, damn it, where did the question I'll, go? I'll read it. I got it right here. It says, with these states that are anti-RSI, for EMS, do you think the future is more sedation only protocols, less intubation, or adopting paralytics? My my guess, and I I'm not going to steal Jason's um, line here because I like that. But my guess is just what I think you should do is if you can't do RSI, I don't think you ought to be intubating non cardiac arrest patients. And the truth is, is maybe you might not need to be intubating cardiac arrest patients. Use an eye gel. That would be my take. I think do it right or don't do it at all. Pickett, what do you think? Uh, I think it, it's sabotaging ourselves. Because as I think as the states say, well, we'll do a sedation-only intubation that's like a halfway measure and it's not as scary as using paralytics, the intubation success rates will either stay flat or they'll go down because now it's, oh, we have this tool. And, and uh, you, you know one of the big dangers of RSI is hubris. Uh, same thing with sedation-only intubation. You, you convince them, oh, I can just get it. I give them drugs and then I can tube them. Yeah. And so ultimately seeing that, then medical directors will look at that and say, why, why should we support intubation on a state level? Why should we uh, give them this tool? Because they clearly can't, still can't intubate. Uh, and whereas if looking at other data that showed that uh, systems that adopted paralytics for intubation saw their intubation success rates go up. Yep. Right. Well, and, and listen, I, th I think this is a major point here that Natalie brings up because <clears throat> those patients are who are in those states 
are going to do what my agency used to do, right? So in Coral Springs, right, that's where the Parkland thing was. We're, we're in the far northwest corner of Broward County. And people used to have, you know, really bad accidents on, on the highway out there. And we would have to wait for the helicopter to land. Why? Because some 22-year-old flight guy can come and give paralytics. So what my guys used to say, they used to calculate, well, I'm only 10 minutes away by driving or 15 minutes away, and let me just haul ass. So you have a guy with trismus, blood everywhere, and they're trying to manage the airway. So they're not intubating. So that never goes into a kind of a registry of how did that patient do if they got intubated or not? And, they, and that patient would die as an example, okay? So th this is what's happening now. We use the Jeff Jarvis method, right? We stay on scene. We have a stop clock. We have, we have clipboards. And the whole mentality is different. Now we don't call the helicopter anymore. And we're actually doing an amazing job. I'm hoping to publish my data to reflect, you know, Jeff, what you have, have seen. And so I, I do worry that states like California, unless they take the time to publish their outcomes, the, the intubated or non-intubated patients, mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard to understand what's really happening out there. So it's a great question. Yeah, and the situation, just to, to get a word in here, a plug for our buddy Veer, you know, he calls that situation uh, SAD, Sudden Ambulance Death Syndrome, um, or SADS. And I just love that. It's that we got to hurry up and rush to the back of the ambulance. And then, well, we're just right around the corner from the hospital. And a lot can happen between here and right around the corner. Uh -huh. A lot can happen from you are parked in on the pad to the time they get into the ER. So it's probably best just to, you know, if you're going to be trained to practice medicine, you might want to practice some of it. We are approaching one hour, 24 minutes here. I mean, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. But I'm just, we should keep, you know, <clears throat> snuffing this bad boy out. I, I think that is probably a good point. I, and it's always a, a challenge because I could talk to y'all absolutely forever. And yeah. considering how long it's been since we've actually been together and um, been sitting around having a drink, I'm, I'm missing it quite a bit. But yeah, I think it's probably a good plan. Yeah. Well, everyone get your vaccines, man. Everyone get your vaccines and then get your ass on a plane and let's go to NAMSP. Well, I mean, we can go to fast. That's in May. I'm very hopeful about that. But I'm counting on I'm counting on NAMSP. Like I'm counting on it. Like come yeah. on. Like I'm counting on it. <laughs> <laughs> which is here in my neck of the woods at the Hard Rock in June. So what get is? your vaccination and get on a plane and come, let's gamble at the Hard Rock. Oh. So, um, yeah, I, I like that. So uh, what was I? Oh, Pickett, I got to say, I'm, look, I'm checking out your video there. You look and like a peacock. Well, it, no, I can clearly see the T-shirt. It's the, the white tiger. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's wearing his uniform, so I figured I had to wear mine. <laughs> um, but I'm checking out. It looks like he is in a closet with a tent. You know, like trash bags hung down the side. It looks like you're about to kill somebody, and you're trying to protect the blood splatter. Is is that what you're doing? <laughs> well, <no. laughs> I have to kill you now, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I had to kind of rush uh, because I'm painting the office right now. We're just ah do these things so it's a complete disaster in there so I, i'm in my bedroom closet which is a great acoustic environment for recording the podcast but i don't want to see my clothes uh, so ah. i put up my green screen plus uh, on this program it's not like uh it's not like zoom where i can put up some amazing background true uh, so I, nobody would believe anyway yep yeah, exactly absolutely well peter jason thank you all so much for joining um mike as always it's wonderful talking to you um, I think we did another great episode of the MS Lighthouse Project podcast. I think we did too. And stay tuned for the audio version. That sucker will be out probably in the next day or so. Um, yeah, just, so just to be clear about that, the um, we will have the full version of the jackassery, um, us flapping our gums. That's on Facebook. I think it'll be linked to on the live.flightbridgeed. No, that's only that's only there when we're live. Okay, so just on Facebook then. Yeah, it'll be on YouTube. Okay, yeah, and then also on YouTube will be just the regular podcast, 
which is just my monologue and the full audio podcast won't have our jackassery. Right. It's, we, we have a tendency to blab on a little bit. Carry on. Yep. Exactly. All right. Well, I will, uh, let me get us out of here. So on behalf, uh, on behalf of Dr. Peter and Tevi, Jason Pickett, thanks for jumping on bro. Last yeah, second man. text. Hey, action. I appreciate Maybe the invitation. Yeah, it was good. And of course, Dr. Jeff Jarvis, who's been listening to and watching the MS Lighthouse Project podcast. We are a proud member of the Flight Bridget podcast network and, of course, a Fire Dog production. We will see you guys on the next one. Bye, y'all.